welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. So greetings and welcome, Gordon. It's really good to have you on the podcast show. Uh, great to be with you. Now, before we go into the heart of our conversations, I do always like to ask my guests something about their origin story. So uh, tell me uh, in your own words, you know, what, what did you study at university? And was it inevitable you would end up um, in academia um, and some of the key sort of career milestones that you've had along the way? Um, I guess it was a kind of an inevitable. Uh, I, um, I studied economics as an undergraduate and then in graduate school focused on international trade and have long been interested in globalization and its consequences for people in different places. The origin story for that is that my parents were mission doctors working in Northern Thailand in the 1960s. And so I grew up thinking about kind of how the different pieces of the world fit together, why standards of living are so different in different places. And it was what we, uh, saw on a day-to-day -day basis and talked about over the dinner table, and it kind of naturally led to my academic interest later in life. Okay, that's great. Okay, so it's, it was kind of inevitable then. <laughs> it's it's good to, it's good to know. Um, now now you know in terms of your focus, you you have kind of quite wide ranging uh, areas of specialty, but I did want to sort of zoom into a specific topic here, which is the the rise of China WTO, which seems to have set a context for the current kind of global trade war that we're seeing. So there's this narrative that we have today, which is that China joined WTO or joined various tr free, free trade agreements in the late 1990s, and that allowed for China's rise in the 2000s, uh, where in essence, China was able to, ex in some ways, exploit the US, uh, and the US lost out uh, by allowing Chinese imports into, uh, in, into the US. China won, US lost. And so as a result, uh, you know, at least since Trump or maybe even before that, there's been this backlash against that to say, look, we've, we've got to stop that from happening. Um, now, now, is that sort of narrative correct or not? Or what's, what's wrong with that narrative? Um, <laughs> uh, there, uh, there, uh, I think that, that you, you gave a characterization that I think would be widely accepted. Um, it has elements of truth, um, but then elements of mistruth as well. Um, the you know the the beginning of all of this is one uh, the end of Maoism in China and China then deciding what is it going to become, and through a series of political conflicts within the country, Deng Xiaoping kind of wins the battle and sets China on this path of reform and opening. So before China ever joined the WTO, China was embracing the rest of the world and understanding that it had to be part of the global marketplace if it wanted to fulfill its economic potential. Um, that created a challenge for the, the existing community of trading nations, which were primarily rich countries. Uh, globalization, and it's, uh, as we know it today, really got going right after World War II. And initially, it was US, Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, and, and, and lower income countries were sealed off by high tariff barriers, or they were part of the Soviet bloc, or, or, what, or what have you. And China's emerging onto the scene is one of the big tests for that community of trading nations. How will we adjust to all of this when we're now trading with countries with much different capabilities and much different earnings? Um, so again, even before the WTO issue comes along, there's this challenge to existing institutions, which were novel. Um, we did what we thought made sense at the time, which was to welcome China in as long as China agreed to play by the rules. Um, we let, uh, uh, in, in so doing, we told ourselves a story about the end of history, about uh, uniform uh, economic progress, peace in our time, um, environmental sustainability. We thought we could have it all. Um, and you know, truth be told, China's arrival onto the global scene and then India's um, related uh, engagement with global commerce led to vast improvements in the standard of living in both of those economies. Um, what they also did was upend global trade because you have countries that are really different from countries that were trading with each other coming onto the scene, and that created winners and losers. And that is the key part of the story. Globalization did 
what we've known for hundreds of years, back to David Ricardo, that it does. And some people gain, some people lose, even if the world as a whole and countries as a, as a whole are becoming better off. And I suppose, I suppose that's a very good point. I mean, we, we know about the theory of comparative advantage, which we learn, you know, at, as, as economic students. And so the idea there is, um, in terms of efficiency, um, if someone on, on a relative basis can produce something better versus you on a relative basis, then it makes sense for them to, to do that and, you know, with specialization and such. So, you know, I, I guess the question there then is even if there were trade barriers, would it still would it have made sense uh, for the U.S. to um, exit various uh, sectors or, or, or manufacturing sectors, given that China, India have lower labor costs, they could, you know, produce lots of uh, lots of uh, sort of manufacturing goods uh, on, on a more relative efficient sort of basis. So it's um, if we imagine a world with much freer trade. So I'll go back to you know 1980 um, yeah. when. We, we didn't know which direction China was going to go. And you say, odds are it's going to open up. Um, odds are we need to kind of welcome China into the global economy. What do we want the world to, what do we expect the world to look like 50 years from now? It, it's one in which there will be much more specialization according to quite different patterns of comparative advantage. So the issue isn't so much where we wanted to go, but how we were going to get there. And what we did not anticipate is that China's rise would be so rapid and that its comparative advantage would be so narrow initially on labor-intensive manufacturing products that it would create uh, a disruption in both the markets for which it was supplying now vast quantities of goods and the markets in which it was demanding vast quantities of inputs to fuel uh, China in. And so it was the speed of that movement, not its direction, um, that was so disruptive for regional economies in the U.S. and many other countries. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But in, in your earlier comments, you mentioned we allow China in as long as you play by the rules. Another story that goes around is that China didn't play by the rules. Um, so is, is you know, you know, I, you know I, I mean, this is kind of amorphous sort of concept. I you know, Western countries often talk about playing by the rules and they break the rules half the time as well. So, but, you know, generally speaking, it, you know, is, is that a fair criticism of China? Um, it is a fair criticism, but I think we want to separate whether the impacts of U.S. trade with China were about China breaking the rules or whether breaking the rules was kind of another dimension of, um, of uh, another consequence of, uh, of now expanding that community of global trading nations. Uh, the, the sectors in which China grew really dramatically that so upended what was going on in the U.S. Uh, industrial heartland were not the ones in which it was stealing in, in uh, intellectual property. Uh, it was apparel and textiles and furniture and shoes and simple electronics. And China wasn't really breaking the rules there. It was doing kind of what the rules of trade said it should do produce the stuff uh, in which you're the least cost producer relative to, to everybody else. Now, there are a bunch of other sectors in which China didn't play by the rules and in which it heavily subsidized uh, its own producers and in which it facilitated uh, the kind of the, the appropriation of intellectual property from U.S. and uh, firms and other countries' firms and that was kind of part of the second wave of, of globalization in China as it moved into things like um, higher end electronics and solar panels and electric vehicles. And now as it's trying to establish itself in semiconductors. But we would have had the China shock on U.S. manufacturing, whether China had played by those rules or not. OK, understood. And and I, I suppose... The question then is, I, I suppose from the sounds of what you're saying, it, it was almost the speed uh, and the narrow focus of this that was the shock. Um, you know, I guess it's, 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 there's not much historical precedent. I'm not sure if Japan is an equivalent or not, because obviously Japan, uh, you know, entered the scene probably more in the auto sector. Um, actually, you know, before that, it was, it was actually in, in textiles, I suppose, as well, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But is there, you know, what's the comparison with the, sort of the Japan rise in the 60s and 70s and 80s? 
So the um the the difference uh, with China is really all about scale. If you look at the pattern of goods that Japan exported as it moved from uh, apparel and textiles into automobiles and electronics, and then what the East Asian tigers did, what Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong did, and then what, what China did, the patterns are almost identical in terms of the sequence of broad sectors in which the economies were specializing in one decade followed by another. The difference is that China is really big. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the other big difference there is We've never seen an economy that large be that narrowly specialized. It had the specialization of, of a Singapore, I'm overstating a bit, but um, it's a bit bigger than Singapore. Okay, understood. Um, and, and so in terms of the, the consequence of the, you know, the rise of China and then, then dominating these particular sectors, another part of this narrative is that uh, in the 2000s onwards, uh, a large swathes of uh, the US economy got impacted by this rise, and there was also job losses as a result of this. Well, is that true? <laughs> Basically. Uh, it is true. And that's uh, this is work I've done with David Otter and David Dorn, kind of we acquired the moniker of the, the China shock or the China trade shock, in which we looked at the labor market consequences of China's export expansion on US industrial regions that had been specializing in the stuff that China end up, ended up being good at producing. And okay. it was very rough on those regions in terms of job loss, factory closure, and the difficulty that those former manufacturing workers had of finding good jobs in other sectors. And the result was endemic joblessness and social dislocation uh, in those places. Okay, and we'll come back to what the appropriate policy response should be. Now, I did want to also bring in NAFTA into the equation as well, because that, that's also been a big part of the, the political narrative in the US in particular. So how does NAFTA fit into all of this? NAFTA was, um, there's a, there are a lot of similarities uh, in that US now trading with a, um, a lower income country, so a new thing, uh, more specialization according to comparative advantage, Mexico being good at um, the labor intensive end of production, which primarily means assembly, putting together automobiles, um, putting together electronics. Uh, but there are a couple big differences. One is, um, again, scale. Um, but the second is the growth of, the, of Mexico's economy versus the growth of China's economy. Mexico thought it was going to become like an East Asian tiger. I was doing dissertation research in Mexico in 1990, working as a consultant for its Ministry of Trade as they were developing their strategy for negotiating NAFTA. And they were, they were telling themselves, we're going to be the next South Korea. And it didn't happen. Um, what made South Korea South Korea was very rapid productivity growth. And, and that productivity growth is something that China has enjoyed Mexico wasn't able to achieve. So we did see expanded trade between the U.S. and Mexico. We did see some job loss in labor-intensive sectors, but it wasn't anything of the magnitude of, um, of, the, of the China trade shock. However, the symbolism of the U.S. embracing NAFTA and a Democratic president doing so had lasting impacts on the ability of the Democratic Party in the U.S. to claim that it represented working Americans. Okay, understood. Now, now, of course, we had Trump come in 2016, and he put all of these international relations right in the firing line. Um, but was there something happening before that under the Obama, Obama administration to deal with the, you know, these uh, different trade agreements? Oh, this started in the 90s. Um, okay. As soon as exports from China started to grow, we started to see that job loss. Uh, the thing was, in the 90s, China was still pretty small. In 1991, China only accounted for a little more um, than 2% of global manufacturing exports. Today, that figure is about 18%. So it's a, a nine time increase. And most of that happened in the space of a decade. Um, but uh, this is something that this the impact of globalization on 
um, U.S. labor markets and adverse consequences for American workers, less educated workers in particular, workers without a college degree, um, is something that happened under Democratic presidents. It's something that happened under Republican presidents. And it happened under a regime about which there was kind of consensus in the U.S. political sphere that we should be embracing globalization and we should welcome China into the global community of trading nation. And so Trump and his bundle of policies, that was a structural break in terms of how the U.S. would uh, address this. Is that fair? It, uh, it was, although you know, we should recognize that um, American presidents um, have embraced pro trade protectionism in the past, just not for very long. It was something of a tradition, starting with Ronald Reagan, that as soon as you got into office, you'd go find an industry located in a swing state and give them really nice, juicy tariffs for a while, keeping imports out. And then our trading partners would take us to, would complain, file, file disputes. We'd eventually take the tariffs off and things would go, go back to normal. Um, so there's, there's elements of that script in what Trump did, but what Trump did was much more expansive and as it turns out, longer lasting. Okay. And so if we fast forward to today, it, you know, recently there's, you know, we've, we've heard uh, new announcements from the Biden administration about imposing uh, very large tariffs on electric vehicles in, from China into the U.S., uh, the there were a certain number of uh, Chinese goods that uh, had exemptions from tariffs, which were uh, which basically have been removed, and so they'll now be uh, suffering from some tariffs. So it seems like there is a new consensus today that you know there should be much more aggressive actions towards China, and this is not just in terms of uh, trade; it's also in terms of uh, IP. Um, trying to sort of stifle the advances in China's tech sector. Um, and then also there's in parallel to that, there is this whole notion of an, a U.S. industrial policy, almost in parallel to what China has been doing. So, it's, you know, support domestic industries. So so is, is it fair to say there's a new consensus that's emerged now on, on this? Uh, I think it is. Um, it's not one that uh, emerged with the same fanfare that the consensus about globalization emerged from. You know, we dubbed it the Washington Consensus by the end of the 1980s, and and President Clinton was championing the, the signing of NAFTA um, and then the creation of the World Trade Organization. Um, the uh, It's not like the Biden administration came in and said, we're fully embracing the Donald Trump's approach to, um, uh, to trade policy, but in effect, they did because uh, they left the tariffs in place and then have used that as now kind of the centerpiece of um of uh, of us uh, of us policy towards china now it's a consensus by default because there's not really a a clear theory of change there uh we want to get china to change its behavior it's not clear how us unilateral actions are going to accomplish that in a world in which the us just isn't as important as it used to be yeah and and it it, it seems like tariffs are uh, at least kind of captures the headlines in terms of, you know, trade policy. What, I mean, what, what are your views of the use of tariffs as, as a trade tool? I mean, the, there must be some advantages as, as well as disadvantages of, of using tariffs. So let's go back and think about, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, and I would, in, and kind of reading the tea leaves um, uh, for the Biden administration, I would say they're trying to do three things. Um, one is bring manufacturing back to the United States and the, with the broader goal being creating uh, more good jobs for people without a BA degree. Uh, second would be addressing climate change. Um, this is kind of, you know, is evident in, in much of what the Biden administration does. And the third is effectively countering China's uh, global economic rise and uh, the difficulty that that presents to us in geopolitical terms, uh, as well as in uh, economic terms. Um, so pick any one of those goals. What are tariffs going to do uh, on that score? Um, well, if the issue is good jobs, tariffs are a blunt instrument. Tariffs are hitting imports. Imports might be related to production. 
production is related to employment and employment kind of is related to whether we get good jobs or not good jobs. So you got kind of three or four links in that chain. We want to do something about good jobs. We should be doing something about the skills of American workers uh, and making sure that those skills match to the sectors that are able to, uh, to supply jobs that pay what we think are good wages. Uh, so I see tariffs as uh, you know, a very indirect way of getting at this. They're popular because they're easy to understand um, and they seem like they should work. The problem is uh, they don't. Now, when it comes to countering China, um, here again, unilateral actions on the part of the United States have limited effect because China then just diverts its exports somewhere else. If we want to counter China, we should be working closely with our allies because they're facing the same issues we are with the way in which China is pursuing a very aggressive strategy of promoting national champions. And instead, we're doing it on our own. Biden is, is emulating Trump in that respect, and that limits its effectiveness. Then on climate change, um, we want to address climate change. We want to make uh, green technology as cheap and as widely available as possible. Uh, putting tariffs on EVs is not going to accomplish it. Okay. That's quite convincing takedown on tariffs there. I, you know, uh, another thing that does come up is whether China is whether tariffs is simply just rerouting uh, China trade through global supply chains and those goods still end up in the US somehow, like via Mexico even. Uh, Chinese goods are finding their way into the US through three means. Um, one is that we're letting them in because Trump gave lots of exemptions that you just mentioned, and some of those are getting rolled back, but plenty of them are still in place. Uh, the second is um, if you import small um, quantities of a good, uh, less than $800 or $400, um, they, you aren't, tariffs don't apply. So China has is now dramatically increased what are known as de minimis uh, um, imports in the US. And that's a way of avoiding those tariffs. And then the third is that the, what you just mentioned is uh, creating a more complex global supply chain. Um, now, from the, from the world's perspective, you know, what is what are the upsides of globalization is creating a much more efficient global production structure. As China's economy uh, matures, it will then be part of bigger and more international production chains. Uh, China began as the place where we would assemble products from parts and components produced in Korea and Japan and technology from the US. Today, it's becoming the place that produces its own parts and components and has goods assembled in uh, in Vietnam and maybe some of those goods in uh, in Mexico. And that's an inevitable part of China's growth and development. We might be accelerating that a bit by putting uh, tariffs on on direct Chinese imports. Okay, so it seems like terror tariffs are a very sort of blunt tool in, in dealing with all of this. Now, you've done a lot of work on the regional effects within the US of globalization. Um, and so... So first of all, how how was that all sort of panned out from a regional perspective within the U.S. and what policies have been employed to address that, if any, and what would you suggest would be the right policies to uh, that any administration should take? So the in terms of understanding the consequences of manufacturing job loss, got to kind of start with with three things in mind. Um, one is that job loss is painful. Uh, we now have decades of research in economics which show that. When you lose a job because your company shuts down, uh, you suffer an immediate hit to earnings, but that hit then translates into a, a, a longer run, slower growth trajectory in your incomes relative to your contemporaries who didn't suffer the same fate. And that's just, it's part of the equation. So we need to then uh, be thinking about policies from the get-go that address uh, that address the consequences of that job loss. Um, and I'll, as I'll say in just a second, we haven't done that. Second thing you have to keep in mind is most people, when they experience hard economic times, do not leave the region in which they, um, they live. Uh, labor isn't as nearly mobile geographically as we thought, except for kind of certain groups of, of highly educated workers. So if you have mass job loss in a place, that place is likely to have a recession and we need to think about how do we address places that are having uh, 
uh, recessions. You know, the 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 third dimension of this is that the policies that we have in place to deal with job loss are really keyed on the state of the national economy and not on the state of local economies. If we're when we're having a major national recession, what do we do? Well, we make unemployment uh, insurance benefits more generous and longer lasting. We didn't do that to places hit by the China trade shock because this was happening in the early 2000s when the rest of the U.S. economy was doing fine. Uh, what else do we do? We often provide more generous uh, funds for worker retraining. So you can go from the thing you were doing before to something new. So think of those unemployment benefits as making sure you got money in the bank to be able to take care of your bills today and the retraining to make sure that you're going to be pivoting into uh, good jobs um, down the line. Again, we did a little of that. The Obama administration uh, provided funding to community colleges in the early 2010s. Um, it was too little and it was kind of too late to deal with the consequences of that job loss, which had started you know, almost um, uh, a decade earlier. So what we have learned is that that we want to bring the same approaches that we apply to the aggregate economy when it's in a really tight pinch to local economies when they're in equivalent, equivalently tight pinches. We have the, the kind of the institutions and the knowledge and stuff in place. We just we just aren't doing it. Is there, I mean, is there some an issue with the structure of the U.S. system where there's a you know I mean, can the federal government deploy regional policies or not, or does that sort of run into state uh, institutions and the way states sort of deploy these sorts of, uh, you know, support mechanisms? Um, kind of yes and no. Uh, we actually have triggers in place which say that we'll give states more generous unemployment insurance um, benefits when uh, state level unemployment rates hit some, um, hit some threshold. We almost never uh, um, deploy those triggers. Um, so, we have we 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 kind of we we're aware of the principle. We just aren't acting on it sufficiently. Uh, now that said, states vary enormously in the generosity of their unemployment uh, benefits. In in Massachusetts, uh, you max out um, at about um, eight hundred dollars in terms of uh, unemployment insurance that are provided. Eight hundred and thirty dollars in Mississippi, it's two hundred and thirty dollars. Uh, so being unemployed is going to depend a lot. The, the, what the government does for you is going to depend a lot on the place um, uh, in which you're living. The, uh, we also, you know, the, uh, so we have an unemployment insurance scheme in place. We also have an incredible set of training institutions that specialize in large part in career and technical education, and that's community colleges. Um, and those Community colleges vary a lot in how good they are at what they do, but the good ones have figured out how to help, how to provide that sort of technical training you need to retool your, uh, yourself very well. What we're not doing is um, transferring that knowledge so that what we have is a national system of retraining and career and technical education that matches um, the needs of places where uh, joblessness becomes acute. I mean, hearing you it sounds at one level very simple. What should be done? So it begs the question of what, what, why haven't they deployed this? I mean, I, you know, I guess under Trump, you know, I guess his administration was maybe so chaotic, and so maybe that's one reason Biden. You'd think he would uh, deploy something like this. I mean, why, why? I mean, why isn't this the the primary way of dealing with the, this uh, issue? Well, one, I want to just acknowledge that there are a lot of states and and. Uh, and counties and cities that have been doing a lot of this experimentation on their own. Um, uh, this is America. It's We have membership organizations and volunteerism and all of this Tocquevelian um, uh, energy that's as evident today as it was uh, you know, 200 years ago. Um, and so it is going on. It's just not going on at, at sufficient scale and we aren't transferring knowledge about the experiments that work to places uh, uh, that, that could very much use that knowledge. Part of the reason that transfer is not occurring uh, is that we have structured the federal government in terms of how it engages in this broad area of policy, which you can think of as place-based policy, helping places that are having hard times in a way that 
silos off different parts of the bureaucracy. One part does small business, one part does education, uh, one part does tax breaks. They do not coordinate at all. The second thing they do is they have decentralized decision-making within this apparatus so that money flows through the system. But in order to get access to that money to benefit from that decentralization, places need to have sufficient bureaucratic administrative capacity to create the right sorts of specialized banks, the right sorts of community college training systems. And that capacity is often um, absent in places that are in distress. And as a consequence, it's too costly for places to engage with the federal bureaucracy because that's a, there's a very high fixed cost uh, to doing so. So it's a vicious uh, spiral in some ways. Yeah, yeah. So once you, you, you know, once things turn south, losing tax revenue and losing the ability to invest in this stuff can put you ever further away from getting access to the federal funding that's there if you can afford to get in line. And places that are really hurting simply can't afford to get in line. And, you know, I suppose all of this, uh, you know, I'm thinking again, put my politics hat on. Then under the Trump administration, did all of this focus on China and trade wars and everything, did actually help the people who had lost their jobs due to globalization or not? Not at all. <laughs> uh, so what did Trump do? Um, Trump put tariffs in place. Um, now, uh, I've already mentioned how kind of there's, um, there's many links in the causal chain from enacting a tariff to uh, a U.S. manufacturing job uh, being created. Uh, and that was even, and so we then evaluated this work I did with Anna Beck, um, David Otter, and David Dorn, looking at the impact of the Trump tariffs on U.S. manufacturing employment, because those tariffs were designed to help places that had lost jobs to import competition from China you know, more than a full decade before, sometimes as much as 15, 20 years before. Uh, and what we saw was basically zero impact. Now, three things are going on uh, that can account for that zero impact. Um, one uh, is that um, we put tariffs on China, not on Vietnam, not on Bangladesh, not on Mexico, and there was trade diversion from China to other places. Uh, and so again, the tariffs, unless we want um, very high broad-based tariffs, uh, that was gonna be an imperfect instrument. But two, as important, if not more so, um, the jobs that we lost a decade, two decades ago, were in 20th century factories that were much more labor intensive in how they made stuff, whether it's textiles or furniture or electronics. Those as in, uh, as production come back come, would come back to the United States, and it's done so a little bit. Uh, it brings far fewer jobs with it than it did in previous decades, um, and that's just the reality of what modern manufacturing uh, uh, looks like. And then the third piece of this um, is that the Trump tariffs seemed kind of crazy and brazen at the time. We didn't know how long they were going to last. Are you going to, how much are you going to upend global uh, supply chains in response to this? You're going to do a bit. But uh, Trump is nothing if not an agent of uncertainty. Um, and that uncertainty is something that might make companies hesitant to act on a new and, um, and, and confused trade regime. Okay. Now, now, um, a big topic uh, that's emerged recently, and you know, we we have a you know a team of economists looking at the U.S. economy all of the time, and one of the reasons we found that the U.S. economy has done quite well over the past year or two has been the surge of immigration that has occurred, you know, undocumented uh, as well as um, documented. Um, so we've seen this big pickup in immigration. Now, in general, I mean, how do you think about immigration? Um, in, in, you know, in the context of everything we've just talked about, um, and then also the recent numbers, which have been quite quite large relative to people's expectations. So the, the answer I'll give will make me sound like kind of a nerdy, wonky economist, but um, this is one of those cases where I think there's some truth in the nerdiness and 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 wonkery. Um, and that is, you think about what is globalization about? Um, globalization is about arbitrage. We've got prices for goods that are low in one country and high in another country, and we export stuff uh, from where it's cheap to where it's expensive. 
Immigration is the same thing. We have labor working in uh, environments in which wages are low, and those same workers can earn much more in a different place. And when labor moves, they're arbitraging those wage differences between countries. That means they're more productive, they're better compensated, and overall GDP for the world uh, uh, is going to increase um, as a consequence. So immigration, like trade, is something that incre enhances global economic efficiency. Now, as we mentioned a little bit ago, globalization creates winners and losers. Well, immigration does the same thing. Um, immigration for the U.S. as a whole um, uh, almost certainly uh, generates positive net benefits um, for the aggregate economy. But there are going to be some folks who gain a lot from that. There'll be some folks uh, who will lose from that. How do we separate the winners um, from, the from the losers? Uh, and you want to look at two things. First, what are the newly arriving immigrants? Where are they uh, living? And what are they doing? So think about Mexican immigration in the U.S. in the 80s and 90s and uh, uh, the central role that that arriving labor played in saving the U.S. meatpacking and poultry processing industries, which are really, really tough jobs located in the plain states, you know, in Nebraska and Iowa and Arkansas. Um, and uh, uh, as American workers educated themselves out of working in those plants, arriving Mexican immigrant workers moved in, saved those factories. That was great for those regions. Um, you saved people's jobs in restaurants and car dealerships and so forth. So if immigrants are moving into industries that export their stuff nationally or globally, it is pretty easy to incorporate them into the local economy. If they're moving in to take jobs in childcare, um, in home reconstruction, uh, in dry cleaning, then if you're a worker um, uh, in a city with lots of immigrants arriving and you're doing that same stuff, you're not going to be exporting the dry cleaning services from one city to the next or exporting uh, child care services. And that can put downward pressure on the wages of those folks. So in the aggregate, I think it's pretty clear immigration is a net uh, gain for the U.S. economy. That's not to say there aren't pockets where people are suffering economic losses as a consequence of immigration. Has the sort of number of immigrants coming into the U.S., has it increased in recent years or not? I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, I mean, it, but it's hard to contextualize this. So the, you know, the U.S. was a nation of immigrants for its entire history up until 1924 when we put the first broad-based limits on. And those limits stayed pretty restrictive until 1965 when we then opened stuff up a bit. From 1965 till about 2006, till the right to, to the Great Recession, um, what we saw was steady increases of immigration from new parts of the world, Asia and Latin America, lots of folks coming in who were much less educated than American workers, also plenty of, of highly educated uh, immigrants. And that pushed the new economy in new directions, expanded uh, 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 different regional economies. Um, and it was a, a period where that the upsurge of immigration took the foreign-born population from being just 5% of all people in 1970 to being about 16% of people by the end of that. Things then really slowed down. So well before Donald Trump came into office, we'd had the better part of a decade of slow immigration. That was the Great Recession and the slow recovery to the Great Recession. So Donald Trump was talking about high immigration flows, which by that point were a decade in the past, still resonated politically. What we've seen is very recently is now a recovery in immigration that had begun uh, just before COVID. We had the COVID interregnum and now have uh, picked up um, again. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion about recently arriving immigrants helping boost U.S. GDP. I got to say, I'm skeptical about this. Um, not that arriving immigrants won't boost GDP, but this is these folks have arrived primarily in the last two or three years. Many of them are asylum seekers um, from countries that uh, in which you know we don't have all that well established networks in the United States, from Venezuela. Uh, and um, uh, and you know, I, 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 I'm I, for that reason. It's going to take a while for those folks to become 
kind of fully productive members uh, of the U.S. economy. Okay, understood. Um, now, uh, another, uh, you know, fun topic is energy transition, you know, policies, uh, at least in the U.S., it seems quite controversial. But, you know, Biden, we've seen, you know, through the Inflation Reduction Act has instituted quite a significant um, a set of policies to help with energy transition. Um, you know, at the same time, there's, you know, the, the other side of the US, which is very against these sorts of policies and wants to sort of promote more sort of, you know, favorable policies towards fossil fuel industries and such. Um, you know, from a policy perspective, I mean, how, how do you think about this? Well, again, kind of going back to the principle of um, what's the problem we're trying to solve, uh, and that is to reduce our carbon footprint. Now, uh, we don't agree that that is the problem, but right now we have the Biden administration in power, and the Biden administration at least sees that as our objective. Uh, how do we accomplish that objective? Um, we need to electrify everything, that is, electrify our power consumption, and then produce that electricity from uh, using uh, green energy. Um, I'll, uh, each of those steps requires a bunch of policy changes that require region, that require state economies to work with the federal economy, that require different state economies uh, to work together, um, and require creating a new infrastructure that people see as reliable um, and, and long-lasting. So we have these high-level goals from the Biden administration. There's a lot of obstacles in the way at the state and regional level, which are complicating this. Um, not that I think Biden administration is pretty clear-eyed about the nature of those uh, obstacles, uh, but this is a, a situation in which governors and also the regulators that manage the U.S. electricity grid, they turn out to be some of the most important people politically at the current moment in time, uh, are really central actors in helping accomplish electrification and the greenification of that electricity. And and it, it seems like if you look at, say, the Inflation Reduction Act, it seems like it's it's a whole, uh, you know, uh, set of subsidies and uh, credit guarantees and incentives for, for the so-called sort of green sector. Do you think that approach would is is works or or, or not? Well, um, it's uh, I I think those policies are constructive. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is uh, the Biden administration is doing a set of things that will help. It's based on a model that individual actions then aggregate up to accomplish the change that we need. And that's useful, but it's incomplete. And it's incomplete because of the utterly bizarre nature of the U.S. electricity grid. U.S. electricity is produced in three different grids, one that's kind of the west of the Mississippi, one that's east of the Miss Mississippi, and then, of course, Texas is its own thing. Within those individual grids, you have subsystems um, uh, that, and some of which trade well with each other, some of which don't trade well with each other. And the result is a fragmented electricity market in which prices and supply vary widely. So our primary challenge right now in pulling this off is to integrate the grid and allow wind power produced in uh, in the plains of Nebraska and Kansas to flow to homes in North Carolina and New Jersey. And that's that doesn't exist right now. Uh, and the IRA uh, subsidies on their own aren't going to accomplish this. This really takes a regional flame, uh, framework with states and 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 uh, utility regulators working together to figuring out how we integrate the electricity market. Okay. Now, now there is a, an election coming up this year. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. But uh, <laughs> uh, so in terms of the policies that we know that um, Trump and Biden may pursue in, in after the election, should they win? You know, first of all, what, what are they in relation to the subjects we've, we've talked about? Um, uh, and and how do they differ from each other? And what do you think their likely effects would be? Right now, Biden and Trump have agreed on a lot of stuff, uh, uh, it just by observation, not in terms of what their original platforms look like, but what Biden and Trump have done when it comes to trade policy look quite similar. Um, what they did regarding energy policy is, of course, 
uh, very, very different. So if we look on paper, what they say they're doing, and the Trump administration Trump hasn't said what he's doing. What we have are people proposing platforms for Trump. Um, those proposals look very different from what the Biden administration has done thus far. However, let's go back to 2020 before the last election and looked at what was on paper and how good was what was on paper a forecast of what the Biden administration would do. Uh, and so that this convergence in economic policy that we're seeing between the Republicans and the Democrats on trade and on industrial policy, I think is real. Um, uh, and I think it has some permanence. And so we've got one set of areas, subsidizing manufacturing, subsidizing favored in industries, keeping trade barriers high that, the, that Biden and Trump would more or less agree on, even though they would be loath to do so. And then stuff related to the energy sector on which they would uh, disagree mightily. Um, then it comes to immigration. Okay. Now, what their their postures towards immigration couldn't be more different. However, the U.S. cannot meaningfully change its immigration policy without congressional action, uh, and unless one or the other as president was able to engineer a compromise which brought Democrats and Republicans together on a new immigration policy framework, What we're, all they're able to do really is tinker at the edges. Now, that tinkering can be very painful for people, um, but it's still tinkering. It's not a massive and persistent change in our immigration policy. And and in terms of using executive actions and uh, you know influencing regulators, is is that a mechanism for the executive to kind of push through changes in any of those dimensions, whether it's immigration, energy, or uh, industrial policy? That's a really interesting question, and you know we're now um, the uh, um, uh, you know U.S. policy is becoming more Napoleonic, uh, where. It's it's through decree and it's the administrative branch. Mm -hmm. You guys have come back to a monarchy. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're we're uh, where uh, power in action resides. Um, but as far as we can tell, uh, achieving permanence via uh, in, uh, executive decree seems pretty hard to do. Uh, and this creates this environment where we kind of bounce back and forth. Now, and that uncertainty is just is not good. Um, however that that back and forth is tinkering. Um, the big things that Biden did were congressional action. Um, IRA, the CHIPS Act, the Infrastructure Act, all of those were bills passed by Congress, signed by the president. That's where big change co comes from. Okay. Now, I did want to round off our conversation with a couple of personal questions. You know, one is uh, we, we do have some younger listeners who are at university and who will be leaving uh, to enter the real world uh, you know, after they graduate, what advice would you give uh, such students? Labor market in many countries right now is uh, is this interesting, challenging uh, thing. Um, so the, the advice I have is, um, you know, when you look out there at different careers, um, don't think of the careers as kind of defining uh, uh, defining the the possibilities that you might have either in terms of the excitement on the job or the pay that you would get on the job. Think of those careers as embodying uh, a set of skills. Um, and those skills is what you get paid for. And those skills is where you derive enjoyment from. And those skills are about problem solving. Um, they're about abstract uh, analysis. They're about interpersonal uh, engagement. Uh, and they're about organizing and managing teams. So look at yourself, understand which of those skills you think you either have or you could acquire, and that would help you stand out, um, and organize your, um, your, your career path based on that understanding of the core things you think you're really good at. Okay, now that's very good advice. Um, and then in terms of books, um, what are some of the books that have influenced you over your, your, uh, your career? The, uh, boy, it's a, uh, it's a hodgepodge. Um, the, uh, a, a set of books I just read were the, uh, the multi-volume biography of Robert Moses by Robert Caro, the power broker. Um, 
which showed us an era in which government accomplished enormous things when it comes to changing an urban landscape in this in this case New York uh and how much that uh that kind of contrasts um uh with where we are today uh in terms of optimism about the future and the ability of American communities to come together and and find new possibilities the book our Town by uh, Deborah and James Fallows, um, uh, two journalists at the, at the Atlantic, um, is uh, I, I turn back to again and again. They also have a nice website where they're updating stories about ways in which communities are experimenting with new paths to regenerate themselves after hard times. Okay, great. The two great books there. Yeah, Robert Moses sounds like, uh, and he's a, quite a colorful character. Big book, though. Uh, so good on you for finishing that one. Um, and finally, what's the best way for people to um, follow your work? I'm not very good at social media. So, uh, but we are uh, doing something um, with my colleague, Danny Roderick at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, and we have a project called Reimagining the Economy. And at um, our website, um, we're developing a data visualization platform. One, it's where we showcase all of our work, all the new stuff we're writing and media appearances and all of that. We're also developing a data visualization platform that will allow folks to go and um, look at the evolution of local labor markets in the United States over the past several decades. And then a new, brand new thing, be able to look at who gets what type of government money for which types of, uh, of programs. Um, so it allows you to kind of play data uh, analyst on your own. Um, and those those tools will be going live um, uh, uh, this summer. That's reimagining the economy. Okay, I'll include a link to the website uh, on the show notes. That's excellent. I look forward to that. Sounds really, uh, really good. Um, so with that, uh, Gordon, thanks a lot uh, for this really informative uh, conversation. And you know, good luck uh, with all of your research that you're doing. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's, uh, this has been a, a really enervating co conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.